Okay, so this week I have the pleasure of talking to kind of an old friend. His name's Robert Henke. You probably know of him as uh, the man behind Monolake or as an incredible performer. Or you might know of him as a wacky Max dude or an inventor of many things. And so we're going to talk to him today a little bit about his work, his background, his idea of the future. And so with that, I'm going to say hi to Robert. Hey, Robert, how are you? Hi, Darwin. I'm pretty fine. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule. I know you're a really busy guy. You just got you just got back from a long trip, right? Uh, a few days ago, so the jet lag is already on its way out. Oh, that's good for you. That's uh, for some reason I uh, I as I've gotten older, the jet lag thing just takes more and more out of me every time I travel. So uh, I can I can hear where you're coming from. So let's start off for those people who aren't uh, super familiar with your work, which I can't imagine there's a lot of them listening to this podcast, but just in case there are, uh, let's have you describe a little bit about what you do, uh, what your work is, and what some of your recent work has looked like. Well, here it starts to get difficult already. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm always struggling with explaining, especially my music. I started making music electronic music and releasing records and CDs some almost 25 years ago. And at this time I was highly influenced by, by two things which were very important. The one thing was more academic computer music, which at this time still sounded very, very different from what you could do at home right. because it required access to very fast computers out of the reach of normal human beings. And um, the other influence was since I moved from Munich, a conservative, beautiful mountain town to Berlin, a dirty and rough uh, metropolis, right at the beginning of the techno culture, I became part of that culture. And I guess it's acceptable to say I helped shaping it a little bit. Right. My music is a, a blend of those influences. I, I still like to call it techno mainly because I want techno to be something much more colorful, diverse, and vivid than it currently, almost 25 years after its invention, became. And that's why I insist labeling it as such and not trying to find an appropriate name for a sub-sub-sub-genre <laughs> to define my specific niche. Right. But of course, you could label it IDM, you could label it EDM, you could label it electro, uh, experimental, uh, ambient, drum and bass, because all of those influences are part of my music. Right. So right. let's simply keep it with techno. Okay, sure. That sounds that sounds great. Now, the other thing, though, that you've been exploring a lot uh, over the last few years has been... Um, both visuals that you've developed or if you, you've worked with other people to develop, as well as some, I mean, your, one of your latest things has been uh, exploring the 1970s worlds of lasers, right? Well, that's actually not one of my latest things because that's something which I already do since six years. Oh, okay. uh, so I'm almost at a stage where I would say I know how to play that instrument. <laughs> the story behind that is that I, first of all, I was always also interested in visual arts. It just never happened that I considered producing this as part of my artistic practice. Right. And at some point, it just became very clear to me that the, the only person who can decide what I do as an artist is myself. There is no external force which tells me no you can't work with lasers or no you can't do something completely different it's only me and once i understood that i decided to just go for it i decided to use lasers simply because i wanted to use a medium which for me all felt to still hold some unfulfilled promises with with video there is such an incredible excellence out there of people who did nothing than the last 20 years occupying themselves with how to organize pixels in space and time, it became very clear to me that I would never reach an appropriate level with my own stuff there. 
Hmm. And I, des I decided that instead of trying to do that, I, I'm looking for a different medium. And lasers were a perfect medium for me because it, on one side, it's obviously fascinating. Right. And I have, a, I have a strong interest in physics. And I've seen lasers when I was already a, already a little boy at, at some research labs, which I visited. So there's an old fascination for this specific type of light there. And I understand the technical process and I understand the limitations. And when, whenever I saw a laser show, I thought there must be more to this. There must <laughs> be more than there must be more than than green tunnels and cheesy animations. Right. I, I, I was extremely convinced that I could do something different. Well, then I just started and it became a programming odyssey and it became a artistic challenge much bigger than I anticipated. Yeah, as I said, now after occupying myself for six years with the topic, I feel I get to a point where I'm actually being able to express myself in a way which indeed is unseen. Yeah, I think that that's interesting you say it that way and, and that you kind of frame it like an instrument and that six years happens to be the time frame. Do you feel like six years represents sort of a baseline time of how long it takes to really go from being drawn into an instrument to being excited by an instrument to end up having the facility necessary to be expressive? Or do you think that that is wildly variable depending on the kind of instrument? I, I feel that every learning period or learning curve has it, its own shape. And typically there are some, some really exciting things happening at the very beginning because the naivety has a tremendous um, creative power. Mm -hmm. You don't know anything about restrictions and everything you do is completely new. Right. So uh, it is super exciting. And out of this naive excitement, uh, a lot of really cool stuff can come out. And then comes the phase of trying to turn this excitement into refinement. And at the same time, you notice that the refinement is much harder than you thought. And then comes this period of doubt where <laughs> the initial uh, rough ideas seem to be too boring, too simple, too easy. Uh, but the more complex ideas turn out to demand much more than you can. This is then a, a period which is quite frustrating in many ways. Then comes a time when, when things start to, to become uh, more interesting again, when you start feeling that you're in control of the instrument. Right. And um, so it's it's kind of an up and down. And I, I feel I'm at the moment in, in, the, in this third phase of this oscillation, which is that I transcend from the instrument itself towards the, the meaning behind it. Right. So it's not about learning the instrument anymore. It's, it's more about, I know the instrument inside out. What is it, what I really want to express with it? Right. So I'm curious when you're, when you're talking about an instrument that is a bank of lasers, I, one of the things I think of when we talk about, when we use the name instrument for something, right? What it generally means to me is a combination of things that are provide facility and limitations, right? So when I pick up a guitar, it's different from picking up a modular synthesizer because the affordances are different, but the limitations are also different, right? And I'm wondering with something, having never had any experience other than like seeing cheesy animations in a planetarium, um, I'm wondering what are the kind of limitations that you run, what are the limitations or what are the affordances that you get when the instrument is built out of lasers and, and spinning mirrors or whatever the heck it is inside of a laser that makes it operate. No, it's exactly the point. It's, it's spinning mirrors, which are in many ways equivalent to high precision loudspeakers. Uh, you feed them with an analog signal and they move accordingly and you have two axes. So there's one single laser beam and you can turn it on and off or change the intensity or change the color and you can navigate this, this beam in two dimensions. Since it's mechanical, there is a strong limitation how fast this movement can happen. Oh, sure, of course. Yeah. And if I simply draw a circle, 
which I could also do as a human being with a laser pointer in my hand, <laughs> I can do this maybe five, six hundred times per second, right. uh, which is very fast. If I want to, to draw two circles, um, things get far more complex because what this implies is I draw one circle, then I turn the laser off, then I stop the movement of the mirrors, then I move my my laser in darkness, so to say, to a point in, this, in the second circle, then I start my movement, then I turn the laser on, then I finish the second circle, then I do the same strategy to go back to the first circle, which means drawing two circles is tremendously more difficult and takes tremendously more time than drawing one circle. Right. So simply drawing two circles is something that requires perhaps five times the time it needs to draw one circle. And that, that means the more complex the things are getting, the, the slower and more flickery the, the image gets. Right. Well, and yeah, and all it all has to, you have to try and do all of the work in the refresh rate time of your eye. Exactly. And if you can't match that, then it falls apart. Right. And that means there is a, a, a strong connection between complexity and um, how stable an image is or how static it feels like or how much it is uh, actually flickering as a, as a very clear side effect you learn to appreciate simple shapes. And since the, the shapes itself are so limited, suddenly sequencing, uh, arrangement in time, arrangement in space becomes extremely significant. And that's exactly why, the, in my opinion, the, the, the terminology of an instrument makes so much sense because it is, is all about actually playing a composition with it. Right, right. And the composition is the arrangement of visual shapes in time. Mm -hmm. You only have very simple shapes, so you can't impress people by drawing a super complex shape. So <laughs> the only way to, to actually impress someone is by finding a meaningful sequence of shapes. Right. Now, in, uh, in, in this instrument that you use, how many lasers are you managing simultaneously? That depends on the project. For my performance piece, Lumiere, I'm traveling with four machines. Okay. And that's basically a compromise out of time it takes to calibrate and set up, shipping costs, and all yeah. the other things. Yeah, I was thinking that this has the... Dealing with lasers has another one of those kind of old-school problems, which is all of a sudden you have to move a lot of atoms around with you every time you go, so you do a gig, right? I mean, it, it is the last 15 years brought significant improvements in technology there, which is that basically all the lasers you're using these days are semiconductor lasers. And that means no big power supplies anymore, no water oh. cooling, oh, no, ga no oh. gas filled tubes. Gas tubes, that's what I was exactly. thinking. That's the one thing so, I remember seeing is the big gas tubes. And this is completely past. Oh, um, interesting. Which is of course, from a nostalgic perspective, <laughs> a sad thing because it would be of course cool but right. if if you have to carry a, a power supply of the size of a refrigerator with you, right? Yeah, it's not a winner. Uh, exactly. <laughs> so now, throughout all of this experimentation and learning the instrument, learning this laser-based instrument, you've also been creating and releasing music. You've uh, you had an album come out uh, earlier th earlier this year, as well as you did a couple of like. I don't know if they're you call them like EP style releases or whatever, but you've been you've been keeping up with your music releases as well throughout the whole thing, right? I try, uh, as you pointed out already, it's it's a kind of a, a difficult act of balancing. I don't want to stop making music simply because I, I I like electronic music too much, right? And I also want to to move on there, but at the same time, my my visual explorations are something that became a essential part of my life too. So I, I kind of tried to make a 50-50 split here. I see, interesting, that's, uh, that's pretty cool. And it seems like quite a challenge because I can imagine that you start working with programming for the lasers or whatever, and that can become a real rabbit hole. You can like crawl in there and <laughs> you know not come out for weeks, right? Well, uh, that's a, a third aspect to everything I do. and. <laughs> It is 
in reality, I do three things. I, I'm, I'm making visual concerts and installations. I make music and I program. Right. And unfortunately, the, the programming layer is very often very hidden uh, and the, the effort is invisible and the beauty is invisible for most people, uh, which is a bit sad because it is a significant part of my work. Right. Uh, uh, even more significant than I would want it to be, to be honest. <laughs> and you say that because a big part of your programming is really doing the things that nobody is willing to do for you. I was always considering hiring programmers. Uh, the problem I have with that is that over the last 25 years, I became pretty good in programming. Mm -hmm. And that uh, implies that someone who is there to help me needs to have my skill set or I wouldn't be satisfied. Right. Um, and finding someone with that background who is uh, willing to throw his energy or her energy into such a project with a completely inappropriate payment um, <laughs> is, it's not going to happen. Yeah, and complete lack of recognition as well. You forgot that part too. <laughs> uh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, you know, there's there's no there's no career path here. You know, <laughs> it's I, I I I cannot say yeah. You you start with this two hundred bucks a month, and if you work for me for the next fifty years, you will probably earn four hundred. <laughs> That's not how it works. Um, well, the other thing, though, too, is is having, I mean, one of the things that I see for a lot of people who get into doing their own software development for artistic purposes is that the process of trying to describe what it is that you want is often 98% of the problem of getting it done. And oh, by the time you get to the point of being able to describe it to somebody, it's easy to do it yourself. That nails it pretty much. In a, in a similar way, this applies to pretty much every working condition in a more complex scenario. Uh, I just managed to offload a lot of my, my administrative work to an assistant. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, she is so good that I don't need to specify every detail anymore. Right, and that's that's exactly where things start to become fun, because uh, I I just tell her, hey, deal with that interview request here. Right, and sh she knows what to do with the specific person in the specific scenario. She understands if it's important or not. She understands the context, and that's exactly the the scenario which I would, of course, also hoping for someone who helps me with programming. Right, because if I need to explain a person. You know, I think the drawing sequence should be first do this, then do this, then do that. And prob probably you need to interpolate here. That's exactly what you said before. If I'm able to express it like that, then actually writing the code is not the big deal anymore. Right, right. So you talk about having these three different kinds of practice that you have. And, and one of the things that I'm always fascinated with is talking to people who do have these various facets to their artistic life and finding out how they, how they got there. So for someone who is comfortable with programming, with visual arts, with, with sound art, what is your background like? What, what kind of crazy childhood did you have that put you in a position to be like, doing groundbreaking visual work, doing, I mean, as you stated, uh, really helping to shape the world that became techno and EDM and these kinds of things. Where, where did you come from? What is your background? Uh, that's totally um, uninspiring in a way. <laughs> uh, it's a classic uh, story of a kid in, in Munich, which in a way is the high-tech capital of Germany, a lot of high-tech companies are in Munich, like Siemens and BMW, right. and a lot of little companies doing stuff for aerospace and defense and stuff like that. So if there's anything that resembles a little bit the gist of, of Silicon Valley, then it's probably the south of Germany. Okay. And 
so my, my family was a family of engineers. They worked for Siemens. They worked for companies like that. There was not the slightest hint of any artistic uh, strain in, in, in our family genes. <laughs> and I was from a very young age onwards interested in the arts. And I went to museums. And actually, I remember that I was from very early onwards more interested in abstract arts and contemporary arts. I, I found early 20th century artistic expression far more interesting than 19th century paintings. Inevitably, at some point, I discovered electronic music, the usual way how you would discover this in the, in the 80s with um, Kraftwerk, Tangerine Dream, Yellow, Depeche Mode, uh, all these kind of things. I, I came to the conclusion that the combination of electronic music and engineering is a good thing. I decided I, I'm going to be a sound engineer because I didn't trust myself as an artist. Not at all, because that was simply not an option. Uh, right. In, in retrospective, I have to say, it was quite difficult to find my way when there is simply no appreciation for the whole concept of being an artist. The, the positive side of that is, of course, that I engaged very profoundly in engineering. And that provided me with a tool set that shaped my art later also in a unique way. Uh, so it's, it has its pros and its cons. But an interesting result of all that is the fact that until five years ago, I always had another job, simply because I didn't trust myself uh, enough to say, I am an artist, period. Right. So up till five years ago, you, yeah. you always maintained other employment. Yeah. Well, I think that would blow a lot of people away to know that. But I can also think... I also think that that will resonate with a lot of people because unless, and, and maybe it's less so now, but, you know, certainly for me growing up, there was always this sense of art is an unknowable lifestyle, right? You know, I think maybe now there's, there's more acceptance of create, you know, the creative life as sort of a, a goal or a direction to take a career. But, you know, growing up, I, I never was, I, it was never thought that the creative side of things was nearly as good as being um, educated and capable at a skill that you could, mm -hmm. that you could trade for money, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, my, my parents were from like a manufacturing background, but I think still carried that same kind of thing, which is like, there, there is a thing that an adult life looks like and then there's art you know? <laughs> and you should stay focused on this other thing and and that had a really strong influence on me and and made it difficult to embrace the idea of of being an artist or calling yourself an artist absolutely i i, I still find it strange you know if the classical situation uh you, you sit in an airplane next to someone and on a long distance flight and at some point uh, out of boredom or uh, real interest, you ask what the other person is doing. And it's so much easier to say, oh, you know, I'm a software developer. Right. Um, that's accepted, you know. Right. But if you say you are, you're an artist, then things get more difficult. You just feel this whole rainbow of expectations and images, you right. know, from uh, he's an artist, he's flying in a plane, he must be super famous. I wonder who he is. Ah, an artist. So uh, probably someone who never learned how to work properly. Uh, <laughs> probably had very wealthy parents. Right? Oh, exactly. <laughs> All these kinds of, the whole scenario, which right. can only be topped by mentioning that you are a musician working with computers. <laughs> right. uh, th that's, the, that's the pinnacle. <laughs> uh, that basically means you're completely nuts and you can't even play an instrument. Right, right, exactly. Um, so I want to explore a little bit about your early interests in this, in sort of abstract and experimentalism. What do you think, what about your background had your, allowed your mind to be open to that? Because a lot of times, you know, going through the typical education process, you're sort of like taught, and, and also because of peer pressure and stuff, you're sort of taught what's cool, what's not cool what is interesting and what's real and what is of value and what's not. When I find people that 
you know, expressed that they had kind of an early interest in experimentalism or abstract art, I'm always curious to know if they've ever kind of thought about why it is that they were open to it when so many of their peers would not have been. I think uh, actually the the answer is already with, with, within this framework, which is if your environment slash parents have no relationship to arts whatsoever, mm. they also, since for them it's basically almost not existing, right? they also have no uh, value, value judgment from one over the other. Right. So I, I believe if you come from this kind of, let's say your parents are teachers, <laughs> as a cliche, and have this, this kind of uh, strong uh, bourgeois background of this is proper art, this is Michelangelo, right. and this is this Joseph Boyce guy. I mean, look at this shit. <laughs> um, they call it conceptual art, which means he can't paint. Right. Uh, so my, my parents were none of those because for them it was simply, they had no opinion about it. Right. There was, yeah, it wasn't even on their radar. Right. Exactly. And I had a childhood with not so many friends because, well, I was a bit of a social nutcase, very insecure, very uh, unhappy and very by myself. And therefore, being interested in the arts uh, was, again, nothing which set me more apart from how I was set apart uh, from the right. day go. You know, so as an as a strange outlaw, uh, it didn't matter anymore that I was interested in abstract art. Right. I mean, in a way, it kind of freed you to be able to be interested, right? Oh, absolutely. There was some sort of vacuum there, but this vacuum also meant that no one uh, had a strong opinion against it. <laughs> and I have to say that there were a few people who I had the, the luck to, to meet uh, when I was a, a child who were actually supportive. Just some older uh, guys at school with who I became friends and who who started engaging me in discussions about about art and politics. A, a specific teacher who was uh, taking me very serious in some of my ideas. So th there were a few people who were supportive enough to to serve as a a, a frame of reference. Right. Right. So there were at least some people who said, well, no, no, you're, you're doing the right thing. You're interested in the right stuff. Um, that's cool what you're thinking about those things. <laughs> that, that is cool. That's nice to have. That's nice to find those people. Now, I'm curious about uh, when you moved to Berlin and, and found yourself like engaged in the budding techno culture. Is that a, is that a point where you kind of like, when I talk to some people and when they talk about that time period in their life, the way that they express it is, I found my people, right? Did you feel that way with the, uh, with the way that the kind of techno and uh, rave, because you were, that was like during the early rave culture days, right? Mm -hmm. Did you feel, did you feel like those were your people or was it just a convenient environment for you to share your work or... Was it that you were more into the artists than you were into the jumper uniforms and the ecstasy pills? What what parts of it represented the draw for you? I, I was never a drugs person. I was just not interested, and I'm still not. But I would definitely say that I, I found my home in, in a certain subculture of, of that scene, which at this time was still very very narrow and very regional in a way. So it, 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 it was really family. It was you, you go in a specific club every Friday to meet the same people, which was a good thing. Right. Because they were, they were your peers and you were happy to see them. And it was uh, a, a very fluid scene in such a way that, for instance, stepping from listening, dancing mode to uh, performing mode or DJing mode was a small step because it was such a non-commercial uh, experimental scene. Well, so it was kind of a naive scene too. Nobody ever oh, really thought that, that yeah. was going to be a moneymaker for anyone. Absolutely. I mean, certainly some people recognized at an early stage that there's potential, but uh, 
it was possible to to do spontaneous parties with friends in in old empty buildings and just bring in some speakers and carrying half of the studio uh, five floors up into an empty office building and say let's have a party um <laughs> right what are you doing next saturday do you want to play at our party oh yeah cool let's let's do that uh it was not hard like oh, i need to talk with my agent or right. um how much do you offer it was oh yeah that's a cool space great idea yeah and uh, yeah that certainly that um was important for the whole scene in, as a in, as a development in, in general mm-hmm so how did you go from being a guy who would show up with half a studio to uh, developing the concept behind Monolake, your work with Gerhardt on developing that, to developing a sound? How did that, how did that all shape itself? I mean, I'm sure it wasn't planned, so I'm just curious how you saw it form itself. Well, the, the mono lake story, I, I think that deserves a, a bit of a longer loop back because it is a, a very personal story, which is a, a beautiful one to tell. Already when I was in Munich, I was obviously interested in electronic music. Mm-hmm. And there was a, a shop in Munich, which was actually a branch of an even bigger shop uh, in Bonn, uh, the former German capital, West German capital. And this shop was pragmatically called the Synthesizer Studio Bonn. And it was pretty much the, the first um, music shop exclusively for electronic music instruments. Okay. And the, the Munich branch itself was located in a, in a fancy neighborhood in a small but fancy shop with big shop windows. And you look through the shop windows and you saw a beautiful blue carpet and little um, keyboard stands with all the amazing gear you could never afford, like a PPG system, a Fairlight, everything you c- would want. Right. And at some point I was brave enough to, to enter this shop and I became friends with the guy who was running the shop. It turned out that he had his own apartment above the shop under the roof, t- uh, filled with even more equipment than the shop had. And so we had some, some funny sessions there making music. And he had uh, he shared his flat with a person I, I really didn't like very much. You have to imagine myself at this point as kind of the very insecure goth boy with an earring, which was uh, quite something at this time, and long hair and black clothes. Okay. And and socially very awkward. The the person living uh, <clears throat> together uh, with Wieland at this flat was uh, very much the 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 antipode to that, uh, like white, uh, bright, uh, close Kashmir, you know, from a from a slightly more wealthy background in a way, just very much the opposite of myself. Right. And I definitely didn't get along with this person. <laughs> and I think this was very mutual. So I moved to Berlin and I started computer science at the very first uh, lecture at the university. I, I look around and guess who is sitting there? This guy. And I stare at this guy and think, Mr. what the Mr. hell is... Mr. Kashmir? Mr. Kashmir um, <laughs> is sitting in my lecture in Berlin. I mean, hello. What the hell? What is this supposed to be? So, and he stared at me, of course. And uh, at the end of the lecture, we, we, we ran into each other like, what are you doing here? Yeah, well, I could ask you the same, right? So let's have coffee. <laughs> and this was, of, and of course, this was Gerhard Beles. Of course. And uh, we became very, very best friends because we noticed that uh, we, ha- we, are, we are complementing each other in a, in a nice way. Uh, and we started hanging out and we started going to concerts and to clubs. And we started, of course, making electronic music together and programming Max patches to do um, the things we wanted to do. Gerhard actually introduced me to Max um, because he already got introduced to it much earlier than I. Mm-hmm. At some point, we created this, created this project Monolag together, and how we came to the name is another funny story, but maybe not that important, and you can read it up in multiple interviews. And we had a pretty nice time together making music, 
And Gerhard finished uh, his computer science studies, and I didn't because I found a very lucrative job in a, a studio, and that killed my academic career as far as studying computer science is concerned. Right. And Gerhard started to work for Native Instruments, and he met another developer there. And they both decided we ne they need to found their own company, and that was the birth of Able. Interesting. And um, when it came to deciding what this, this music software actually is supposed to do, Gerhard basically uh, <clears throat> came back to me and said, hey, Robert, we, we need to talk about things. And that's how I became part of this whole thing. Interesting. And it was very clear from my perspective that the one thing no one did before is creating a product that is really tailored towards the needs of, of us, of us electronic music people, of us people who have a desire to perform with a laptop on stage right. and do something that is informed by our way of thinking about structure and music and sound. Yeah. And at, at this time, it's culturally interesting if you if you look back at this time there were two two dominant ideas the one dominant idea was uh, an interface design idea of dangling cables and wood panels right in, in on a screen to not alienate people who came from hardware so <laughs> that they have something that looks like hardware on screen which we found, which we found childish right the other thing was the idea of um, computers in a studio serving the high-end market. This whole like, we have a 32-track Pro Tools rig. Um, right. There was a specific case which I very vividly remember. A German sequencer manufacturer, which later was bought by a computer manufacturer, had this ads where you saw on the console a Porsche car key. <laughs> so, you know, the, the, the marketing was aimed towards the the Trevor Horns of this world. Right, right. And this was so much not our target uh, group. And we knew that if we create something for a different audience, we will pick up people who were completely not the target group of all the other companies. And right. the rest is history. Yeah, well, and, and there was a lot of brilliance in that because... So much of what computer, commonly available computer music tools were just just hearkened so so heavily to the past. I mean, the fact that everything really relied on the tape machine metaphor when it didn't have to anymore. But it was it was amazing, you know, that 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 metaphor had stuck so completely with the music software world and i mean you still see it in in most software packages and you see it i mean to me i lately i've been doing a lot more work with video editing and it's really shocking to see how little has changed for video editors in terms of the paradigm that they work and how much it's very much still like working with two video tape decks and a video mixer right yeah yeah and, so true. Uh, yeah, and it's it's just really odd to see that the the tools grab these metaphors and stick stubbornly to them, and so it was a really big it was a pretty big shakeup to uh, to see what Ableton came down with. But boy, it hit it hit big and it hit fast. It uh, I remember when version one came out. I was uh, I was you know part of I was a non employee but part of the cycling seventy four world then, and I remember seeing what was coming down the pike and being very excited about it. And that's cool. Now, to to what extent did what became Ableton Live? To what extent did that meet your needs, or and to what extent did you still feel like well? it's good, but I need to continue making my own tools. I mean, was there a time period where you uh, were a live performer, uh, Ableton Live performer, or did you continue to make your own tools? I was always a bit twisted in my emotions towards the software. For, for live performances, I embraced it very early. Mm -hmm. Let's say from version 2 onwards. Okay. It forced me to to very much uh, redefine my my performance practice in a way which was the result of technical limitations. 
uh, I'm a synthesis person, and I like I like the idea of real time synthesis. I like the a, a big part of my performances were manipulating sound. So I'd rather have a simple synthesis algorithm, let's say an F an FM sound, where I have a knob which drastically changes the timbre mm -hmm. as as part of the performance practice. Right. And uh, the the first versions of live. Uh, were simply sample loop based because that was the only thing which could run in real time on, on the computers <laughs> at that time. So, and this brought in some, some static loop based appeal into my music, which I didn't find appropriate, found appropriate and I still don't do. So things started to really become interesting to me with life four with the addition of uh, synthesis. Right. If I would, should name a single contribution to the software which was most significant um, than its operator. Right. Uh, well, I remember when Operator was released, you were very, you were very closely identified with it. Um, my assumption is you had a hand, you must have had a hand in its design, but I know that, uh, I remember being at the NAMM show when it was introduced and you were there and, uh, you know, I would talk to you and you would, sort of you were into it you found operator a, a really great tool for expressing kind of your synthesis voice unfortunately i lost the original max patch which um was the the prototype uh i i looked through all the backup drives and uh it is gone and it's it's really sad it's not it's not on a cd somewhere it's it's just nowhere oh, man. Uh, because uh, in, indeed, operator is let's say eighty to eighty-five percent uh, my development. I see. Interesting. Well, and I remember when it first came out, playing with it. You know, my experience with FM had, had always been like, you know, the DX7 and that kind of thing. And so in my head, it represented a certain kind of thing. And then um, the the banks of sounds that came with the you know the original implementation of operator kind of twisted my head up because there were many things there that I considered atypical for an FM sound. And it opened my, it opened my mind up to think of FM in a different way. You know, so for that, I actually owe you, owe you thanks because it, it started me on a path of like considering FM as a lot more interesting of a tool than just you know, being able to play really bad Fender Rhodes emulations, right? Actually, in, in all defense of John Chowning and DX7, um, the Fender Rhodes emulation is gorgeous. <laughs> uh, this this has to be said. Um, <laughs> 20, 22 years, or 20, no, 22 years, no, 32, damn, 1983. I can't calculate anymore. That's a sign of age. Um, 17, well, <clears throat> 30, 30 odd years. So, 30 something years after the invention of the DX7, the, the Rhodes emulation is gorgeous. Uh, and a lot of the other presets in there. So, okay. Uh, my, my, my point when, I, when creating Operator was I didn't want to compete with one of those really big FM synthesizers out there, like with eight operator things with uh, arbitrary feedback loops, because I noticed that. 90% of the sounds I found interesting could be done with only two or three operators. Right. The rest was just to make it uh, playable over a larger keyboard range or doing things oh, which sure. within the paradigm of life could easily be achieved by stacking. Right. The simplicity of the concept was uh, a very big part of it. Then on top comes my certain, my love for detail. Right. Uh, there, is, there is so many hidden details in operator which... I'm still very uh, happy with. For instance, instead of having a noise generator, I have a noise loop. And that was an interesting conflict because the developer said, but the noise loop is, is not noise. It's a noise loop. It's totally inferior to noise. And I said, yes, but you can pitch it down and it actually becomes grainy. Right. Um, and um, you can pitch it up and it becomes a tonal structure. And you can modulate, you can create hi hats which sound the same exactly each time you play it, if you like, or it put it into free run mode, and it sounds slightly different. You can create flanging and phasing noise effects. Uh, so 
a lot of thoughts went into these things which are simply noise on the front panel. Right, right. That's that's really pretty fascinating. I I didn't know that about the about the noise system on there, but of course it's. Uh, well, now we have two noise waves. Oh, okay. There's two two noise waveforms now because there is, of course, also a, a valid argument for the classic, classic um, pseudo random noise. noise. Right. So basically, operator now offers noise loop and noise, and but these are the things which I really like finding very very simple things with with great potential yeah that's cool so i'm uh i'm curious now one of the things i heard recently and i don't know if it's a rumor if it's true or not is that you have started playing around with modular synthesis now i remember talking to you a while back and uh mentioning that i was kind of into it i was wondering if you were into it and you were kind of like you know i don't know if i want to go down that hole again right but it sounds like maybe you have. Is that true? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, the, the, and I'm still not sure about it. Uh -huh. The reason why I ended buying modules was a, a funny detour. I, I bought a Lindrum uh, simply because I thought it's such a great icon of computer and music technology. Right. And I saw one on eBay and I had the money to buy it. And I thought, okay, let's do that. I really uh, put it in my heart because Roger Lynn did a, a really, really good job with this machine in many ways. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I also bought an MS-20 and I, the MS-20 didn't really do much for me, um, which surprised me because a lot of people love it and I know a lot of great music made with it, but it had too many buts for me. You know, this is not, not how I, the envelopes are not how I want them. The, LFO is not what I want them, the, the oscillators are not as stable, and so on and so on. The single thing which I tremendously liked was actually the filter section. Mm -hmm. And what I did with the filters was using the filters to filter some of the drum sounds from the Lindrum, which came out more as an accident. It was simply the result of the MS-20 and the Lindrum sitting next to each other in the studio. Well, and, and the Lindrum having all the individual outs so that exactly. you can afford it. Uh, yeah. But I find it remarkable that thing as, as spatial closeness uh, hints to, to certain things you do or you don't do. Right. Uh, because if, if they would be on two different sides of the studio, it would require a lot of cabling through the studio, and you would never do that. Right. At some point, I noticed that, okay, the envelopes of the MS-20 I don't like. So let's just buy a modular case with envelopes. And then I did. And then the next thing was, well, actually, maybe I can replace the whole MS-20, which takes up my space, by a simple MS-20 filter. Right. So I bought an MS-20 filter and get, got rid of the MS-20. And suddenly I had my first small duck fur right there. And, you know, ah, it would be nice if I could have a second filter to filter a specific part of the timbre in a different way. Um, I could actually make use of a second envelope generator. Ah, I need a new VCA. Mm. <laughs> there you it go. Requires, it requires a mixer. Well, and that's a bit of a nuclear chain reaction going on there. Yeah. Yeah. You, you put one piece of equipment in your rack, and it immediately um, creates desire for two more pieces. Right, right. And, um, <laughs> and, and there begins the geometric progression, right? Exactly, yeah. <clears throat> And suddenly you notice that you spend an amazing amount of money and time and effort into building this, this stupid wreck. So I'm wondering then, you said that you're not sure of it as, you're not sure of it yet. Do you mean you're not sure how it fits in your system or you're not sure if it speaks to you as an instrument or you're not sure if you're going to get into it further or what, what aren't you sure about? I'm coming more and more to the conclusion that the artists I admire most do whatever they do with an incredibly limited palette, right. including a very limited set of tools. Right. And uh, I, on the other side, recognize a lot of artists who at some point earned enough money to afford whatever tool they like, who ended up building gigantic studios, and I haven't heard any convincing music from them anymore. 
Yeah, oftentimes they have to abandon these incredible studios in order to get any work done. Exactly. And I, my personal problem is that I so much come from the engineering background and that I admire machines because of their engineering. Mm -hmm. So I have, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a split personality here. There's a part of my personality who likes collecting specific machines mm -hmm. simply because they are so cool. Right. Now, if, if I had a, a, big, a big castle or penthouse loft with a few hundred square meters and I could pick up, let's say, a Cray MXP somewhere, <laughs> uh, I, I would just put it in the living room with a terminal and run a stupid Space Invaders game on it right. just, 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 because, just because I can, you know? <laughs> so... And if people ask me, wow, what is this? Then I would say, well, this is the machine which was used to actually simulate nuclear explosions. Right. <laughs> now playing Space Invaders. Right? Now it's playing Space Invaders, yeah. <laughs> How cool is that? So what I'm currently doing is I'm rebuilding my little studio and I'm forcing myself to throw out a lot of things. Interesting. Uh, simply because it is mostly a distraction. and. If you have a musical idea and you want, let's say, your, your musical idea requires a string sound, a, a polyphonic string sound, how many instruments do you really need to get this done? Right. Well, I would say 90% of the cases, the stuff which comes with in Ableton is sufficient. Right. If that is not sufficient, then the stuff with in Ableton plus, um, let's say, an even tight reverb box is sufficient. Right. If that is not sufficient, well, maybe a profit 12 is sufficient but that's it right uh you don't need to have a jupiter 8 a juno 6 a cs80 etc 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 stacked uh on five walls of your space to to get the strings uh, right. quite the opposite if you have all those machines uh, the time it takes to decide which machine to use to make the cabling to, to uh, put it on the mixing desk to find the, the ground loop the bookkeeping work gets so hard big right. that you end up losing the idea well and not not to mention and and i've also felt this way at one point i had a studio with an amazing collection of analog gear <clears throat> and two things happened first of all at any given time fully 30 percent of it was not working for some reason because it's old stuff and it breaks right but the other thing is i found that i got too focused on collecting and lost my focus on making music. That's exactly what I meant. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and so I can see where, where greatly reducing puts you in a different position. I mean, for me with my modular thing, basically, uh, a, a little while ago, I said, no more, I'm going to stop. And mm -hmm. it's been interesting because I actually went through a little bit of withdrawal it's like I would still go and look at the for sale sites because maybe maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there is something that will change my life, right? It was almost like an addiction, like a chemical addiction. It was very, it was very odd to see it have that effect upon me. But uh, you are certainly not the only one. I mean, this, despite the knowledge that having too much equipment is bad, <laughs> actually selling equipment is so difficult. Or I, I still have the habit to occasionally look at eBay. I mean, Jesus, no, I don't need another synthesizer. Well, and you'll always find that ridiculous thing like, like you know, oh, there's one of those triaxes. I always wanted one. Oh, of course. Um, you know, uh, my, 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 latest, my latest sin, which puts a smile on my face because it's, in one way, it's so idiotic. On the other way, it's so understandably cool, is a Publisson Infernal Machine. Oh, my goodness. Which is... Uh, a ridiculously looking reverb from France made in the mid eighties, which is, is an absurd box in its, in itself. Um, but it's just one of those things which you have to use occasionally simply due to the fact that it's such a great piece of complete nuts gear. <laughs> Complete nonsense, right? <laughs> well, you know, it, I'm, I'm pretty sure it sounds great. I, I don't have it yet. I'm waiting for it to come back from service. That's but awesome. at the end of the at the end of the day, 
it's pitch shifter plus reverb. Right. So it's it's nothing that in the year 2016 you couldn't do at ease with a reactor ensemble. Right, right. Uh, but still, the, the fact that I turn this machine on and I have this, this absurd orange, green, blue design. <laughs> um, now it's... I immediately hear pretty much the whole Ina GRM earcom back catalog when I turn it on. <laughs> That's great. That's awesome. <laughs> well, and you know, I think I think there are those identifiers though all over in the world of music music gear. I mean, I I think that like in the guitar world, orange amps continue to exist simply because people see an orange amplifier and imagine a certain kind of sound coming out of them doesn't matter if the sound even does come out of them there's something about the imagination that kicks in when you get this kind of symbolic gear connection right well that's that's the whole point why uh, it's not so easy for me a, a classic example is i'm a i'm a proud owner of a ppg mm -hmm. and i think this is one of the most beautiful sounding synthesizers on this planet with a very specific palette and my latest album release is, is full of it, including songs which contain nothing but PPG sounds. Mm -hmm. And there is also plugins which do a, a pretty good job in, in emulating this machine. Mm -hmm. But for me, the whole point of using the original machine is that I'm not looking at a screen. I'm not having the capabilities of using 20 instances at the same time. But I'm, I'm really focusing on these knobs in front of me. And there's nothing else. Right. It's just me, me listening, playing, and tweaking knobs. Sure. And that's a, a, a certain type of focus that I found pretty hard to achieve when I'm, I'm working in, entirely in software, where I tend to do too many mouse clicks all the time. Right. And that's, that's a... a in parts, a specific problem of mine that I tend to make things too fragmentary, too overly complicated, too, too many micro edits. And therefore, the limitations of old hardware actually helps me avoiding a bit that, that tendency. Right. So then, I mean, what you just said actually kind of like points to a bit of a conundrum though, right? Because you talk about yourself as having a love of detail. But at the same time, you, you talk about how you have this historical lack of trust in yourself as being an artist. That combination would tend to make a person, would tend to make one think that, oh, you're one of these edit junkies, right? Mm -hmm. you, mm -hmm. uh, you'll do a thing and then you'll edit it obsessively and... I don't know if that's true or not. I, uh, you know, you could tell me. But what can you do in that scenario? What do you do to like tamp down the demons that are telling you, you know what, seventy-five more edits on this will make it much better, or spending three more days on this synth sound will make it better, or yeah, it's that's just never going to be good enough because it's not as good as X. How do you keep those voices out of your head? This is probably the most difficult question to, to answer uh, because those voices are very loud, yeah. always. Yeah. I'm very often extremely insecure and not satisfied with my work. Uh, it's just that I force myself to move on and even release things because I know that it, it wouldn't change. And I know that other people have different opinions uh, about the quality of my work. And that I can only make the decision between not releasing any work at all or accepting the fact that it's never as good as I wanted it to be. Right. What I, what I do is I tend to create scenarios with, with inherent limitations. For instance, like my laser work, where a certain, a certain amount of, of detail is simply not possible and where I'm forced to think in larger structures because that's the only way to express myself right that that's helpful um and i have a few projects where i'm operating on on that basis and what i actually want to embrace more after years of working pretty much alone i decided it's really time 
to start collaborating more. And the one of the last extremely successful collaborations uh, was with the person who was actually mixing my album. I decided that I don't have the appropriate studio space to, to listen to it in a correct way. And I also decided that I want an external person to mix it because I want to have a person with a different aesthetics to interfere with my work. Right, right. And, and I chose a, a person who is a, a loose friend of mine, whose work I really admire, whose work I know since a long time, and who has in many ways very different concepts of music than I have, but where we have an overlap in terms of fascination for sound. Mm -hmm. And that's Mark Ernestus, who is one of the founders of Basic Channel and uh, one of my Berlin techno heroes from back in the days, sure. who, is, who is nowadays, um, since the last five years, recording music and touring with a group of Senegalese uh, musicians, doing something very, very different, but has a fantastic ear and a fantastic attitude towards mixing. And I worked with him on the album. He helped me actually reducing complexity. Mm -hmm. He helped me to, to throwing out a lot of elements and repeating other elements to get a bit more uh, a steady state, a continuum, a, a flow into my very fragmented works. I found this incredibly satisfying and we will see how the the world outside uh, perceives that. <laughs> well, that's that's great though because it does seem like you know your work with Gerhardt was certainly successful as a as a collaboration, and I know um, I didn't get a chance to see you when you did the uh, performance work with uh, Tariq, but everybody that did said that as a collaboration that seemed to be a fabulous thing. So it seems like you really you're a person who excels at collaboration which I think a lot of people don't. I think a lot of people are either too, you know, you talk about insecurity, but I think an awful lot of people are too insecure to collaborate. Yeah, there's, I mean, you have to, collaboration requires that you accept that someone else has a different idea. Right. And I would say not only that you accept it, but that you embrace it and that you welcome it. Uh, and, uh, since I have always this, this in, in most, most collaboration roles I had, I had this abundance of ideas and then comes an external force who says, this is good. This is good. This one, throw it away or <laughs> no, actually this one is good, but it can't come in this position in time right. because you are just establishing that. So it makes no sense if you do this now. Right. Uh, Gerhard's strength, in my opinion, in our collaboration as well as uh, in his role as, as the Ableton CEO, was always in putting structure in things. And that's why, why he's a perfect CEO. He's the one who, who can make the, the right global decisions to say, that's what we should do. Right, right. And this is still something I, I, I really admire him um, and where I think I learned a lot. In a way, mixing with Mark Anestos was the same thing. He was the one who said, well, I think this part here needs to be more dominant in this track. And this part I would actually make very, very low in level. Right. Also, my collaborations with Christopher Bauder, with whom I do this, this large scale kinetic visual installations. He's also someone who, who is very good in actually making decisions. Uh-huh and having an overview and I, I noticed that i tend to to enjoy working with people who can have this role and this requires of course in, in the case of christopher it's interesting because the, usually the way the way how i work with christopher bowder is that he has a, a strong overall concept and i make the music so he's he's doing the he has a strong visual concept what he wants to do and i do the sound side and but unlike all the other people he's he's collaborating with, he is not acting like a boss in our relationship. I mean, right. he, he's 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 commanding a whole company of, of people working for him. But our relationship is different. We are working on equal terms. But still, what he's doing is 
he is the one who, who arrives later at some point when I made things and is listening to things and is looking at the visual side and saying, okay, this part here has to go. Right. And, and that's, of course, super painful. And it, it took me a while to, to get comfortable with that situation because you, you don't want to hear that. You don't want to hear that this fantastic sound design just has no place in this piece. But I, again, I learned that most of the time, if he says this has to go, there is a reason for that. Right. And yeah, this is the kind of, of, of things uh, and relationships in, in work, which I personally find very benefiting. Well, I think that that's a really interesting point. And it's one of the reasons why it always works best to work with other strong artists. If you're working with someone who, who doesn't have a strong opinion, then all of a sudden it's, it's maybe too much like, I don't know, too much like ripping a bandage off too slowly, right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, if you yeah, have absolutely, someone with yeah. a strong opinion, you're gonna get the real, you're gonna get the real story, you're gonna get a reason why, and if you can, and if you can respect their vision, you can, it almost ends up like being it's a release. It's a release from some of the struggle of saying, I have to make every decision, even if it doesn't seem right, you know? So there's, there's some, there's some really strong value in that, I think. Oh, absolutely. It, it helps because in a, in a positive way, it also helps get, gaining reassurance about the good ideas. Right, right. See, because if you work with someone who has the, the balls and the knowledge to say, this part here sucks. Right. And you can also trust this person that the parts which have been identified as they are good, mm -hmm. that they are good and that they are not just okay. So it works both ways. Um, so it's, I, I, yeah, having, having decisive people with uh, strong opinions is definitely something which is helpful in an artistic context. Once you get used to it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, as you said, it's, it requires trust and it requires also you have to, to learn to let go. And you have to learn that uh, criticism of your work, of uh, let's put it this way, uh, you have to learn that criticism of parts of your work does not imply that your work in general sucks. Um, and it certainly does not imply that you are an idiot as a person. <laughs> right. Right. It's just that this specific thing you did doesn't fit in this context. Right. That's a, a, a very important way to look at things. And I guess that reflects back to personal relationship, that reflects back to politics, that reflects back on how you treat your employees. That's all kinds of things you can, you can learn and apply to another different context. Right, right. Oh man, I could talk to you all day, but unfortunately, my time <laughs> with you is up, and it was up a yeah, long I time ago. This. But well, <laughs> so before I go though, I want uh, I have watched you, you know, both seeing your performances and listening to your records and and talking to you online and offline. I've seen you dip your toes into lots of different things, whether it's building works off of field recordings or working with different kinds of visual visualizations or different kinds of hardware or different software uh, enablers, right? Um, I'm curious, what is, it that, what is it that you have your eye on as maybe a next thing to explore? Well, um, on my personal roadmap, there is something very bizarre which makes complete sense. So... Um, I decided to make a audiovisual concert piece which uses five Commodore CBM 8032 computers on stage. And um, that requires mastering assembly language. It doesn't require learning assembly language. It requires mastering it because I'm I do... I'm you, I, I, I forgot that you were into this, but I've been watching... I don't know, is it on Facebook or Twitter or someplace where I started seeing pictures of you with these old CBM machines? And I was like, oh, my yep. God, he's he's lost it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, um, I assigned a whole year of work for that. So I'm, I'm deadly serious. I bought nine of those machines on eBay um, 
in order to get five machines out there which work flawless. Mm -hmm. And uh, I dig deep into understanding the hardware. And as I said, I will, I have to become, this, this whole project can only work out if I become a master in assembler programming. Because I need to, to, to get every single CPU cycle out of these machines I can get. Right, right. Because those machines were not intended to do real-time video graphics. Right. Those machines were not intended to do sound. But if you are really smart, you, and if you apply an artistic mindset of a very abstract thinking, you can actually achieve something with these machines, which no one had done before. And I'm convinced that I can do that. Is that, is that machine based off the old 6502 chip? Absolutely. It is? Oh, see, it is. That's, it that's is. where I got my programming bones. I bought this book when I was... Yeah, there. Branch Not Equal. That's the, yeah, the Landfall book. Oh, my goodness. You are into it. Watch out. But uh, I remember being fascinated by working with that stuff. It was, uh, it was amazing to do, you know, to be working at such a small level. You know, the amount Absolutely. of work you have to get to do, like, the equivalent of an if branch is crazy <laughs> and at the same time once you actually accomplish it you feel like you're you really are controlling the world you know it's amazing stuff yeah absolutely i mean uh it is hard to uh, explain people that the concept of floating point math is not existing right or right. that doing a multiplication of two numbers if the result is something larger than 256 requires actually a lot of thinking right right <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Unbelievable. So uh, you're giving yourself a, a year on this, huh? When yeah. did that year start? Well, I want to be ready for performing this in 2018. Okay. Because I'm currently working on the third iteration of my laser performance project, which will premiere at the Barbican in London at next February. Uh -huh. So my winter and... Basically, everything from now on is dedicated to work the lasers again. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, I dive into programming assembler. I see. Crazy. Yeah. Unbelievable. Well, I am, I am going to be anxiously watching you uh, go through this process because, again, for me, that's uh, that was doing 6502 assembly was like one of the first times I really felt like I was master of a machine, and maybe one of the last times too, quite frankly. <laughs> <laughs> so true. So, Robert, I want to thank you so much for your time. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule and having a chat. I really do appreciate it. Well, you're, of course, very welcome. <laughs> we'll talk again soon. Bye. Many thanks to Robert for his time and uh, for the great chat and also for the opportunity to kind of peer into his brain when it comes to collaboration and how he chooses his projects and even what he's thinking when he bought all those pet computers. But in any case, I want to thank him so much for the time. I want to thank you for listening, continuing to listen to the podcast. I'm getting up there in, in numbers again. We're going to be hitting number 150 pretty soon. That's pretty incredible. And it's all thanks to the great people that I've been able to interview and you, the listeners. Thanks so much, and I'll catch you next week. Bye.